Biaki Akuchki has always been a popular, powerful captain of the Gotei 13. In the Soul Society arc, his role as the main antagonist meant he was the yardstick by which Ichigo had to be measured up to in order to succeed. He was the final test for Ichigo, and as such appeared incredibly powerful and at times even overbearing and impossible to overcome, with a mastery of his Zanpak toe and a litany of abilities at his fingertips. Byakuya was an effective portrait of the ultimate Shinigami, even if we knew there were still stronger captains waiting in the wings that hadn't yet been given the chance to properly shine in the story. This showcase of his power continued throughout the series, with Byakuya almost effortlessly dispatching of the seventh Espada before teaming up with his then-rival Kenpachi Zaraki to bring down the Zero Espada at the climax of the Arankar arc. So, Byakuya has always been strong, a role model and a picture of power and composure among the Gote 13, but come the Thousand Year Blood War arc, he becomes a much harder character to pin down. Much like several other major supporting characters, Byakuya undergoes something of a transformative journey in the final arc of Bleach, though the circumstances around his growth and the results of it are murkier than most, and there are a few reasons for that. In this video, I want to take a look at why that is, the journey this character goes on, and what we can take away from Byakuya's role in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, from his seeming resurrection in the Royal Palace to his place and newfound power in the Second Quincy Invasion and beyond, I want to see if it's possible to glean just how strong this character actually became, especially as the series grows rapidly awash with a sea of characters becoming exponentially more powerful as the war crescendos to its conclusion, making it all the more difficult to see just how far certain Shinigami have come. Before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take that support for me another step further, I do also have a Patreon as well. And as always, I just want to give a massive shout out and say a huge thank you to everyone supporting me over there on Patreon. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. And of course, there will be spoilers Spoilers for the entirety of the Thousand Year Blood War arc in this video to come. As far as I'm concerned, Kubo has always written Byakuya Kuchki and Kenpachi Zaraki to be reflections of one another, and that's reinforced by their respective positions and roles within Bleach, translating to the journeys they both undergo in the Thousand Year Blood War arc as well. They're both roadblocks for Ichigo early on in the series, each one acting as a major milestone in the development of our main character's own power, firmly fixing themselves as some of his closest rivals in the process. They both invade Waco Mundo to later save Ichigo and his friends, and they both take down an Espada on their own, before even going so far as to begrudgingly work together to defeat Yami at the end of the Arankar arc. But, as if to hammer home this idea that they are very much two sides of the same coin, Kubo puts them on a collision course with each other, as though a battle between these two titans is inevitable during this period to root out the strongest between them to prove who would come out on top in the end, the aristocratic noble or the beast from the slums. Honestly, as a quick aside, I've always believed that they did actually battle each other during their off-screen showdown with Yami, and that's where the majority of their serious injuries that we see them with when they return to the Soul Society actually came from. After all, Yami is a proven joke, and I'd be surprised if transforming into a bloated ape was really enough to suddenly turn him into a threat, and Zaraki seems to imply the same when he comments on how boring the fight against the Espada actually was once it's all over. But anyway, come the Thousand Year Blood War arc, and again, their respective paths are very similar. Both of these characters are two of the most reliable warriors the Gote 13 has, yet they're both humbled by the Sternritter during the first Quincy invasion. One is gutted by his own Bankai to the point of near death, while the other is senselessly beaten into a coma, even with his, at the time, full power released. 
They would both go on to recover from these near-death experiences and gain tremendous new strength. Where Zaraki killed three Sternritter in the first invasion, Byakia defeats three Sternritter at the same time in the second, while actually dueling five at once. And then finally, they both ascend to the royal palace where they remain active combatants until the very end. I guess what I'm saying is their paths to power are very much mirrored, and where Zaraki gains immense power in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, I think so too does Byakia in a very similar way, just with considerably less spectacle to back it up. As a result, I often think Byakia is somewhat overlooked in the discussions regarding how powerful certain characters became in the final arc, though admittedly that's perhaps his own fault. And this is what makes Byakia such a difficult character to place in this part of the story. We as readers know he has become extraordinarily powerful, yet he barely does anything once he's revived and returns to the battlefield. You get brief flashes, a fleeting glimpse here and there into the heights he's now achieved, but never anything truly conclusive. Instead, for the majority of his time in the second Quincy invasion and beyond, Byakia is mostly a silent, stoic, statuesque observer, somebody who treats the war with a casual ambivalence, barely raising a hand to wield his Barnkai against his enemies, and instead seems to mostly follow his own subordinates around without much agency of his own. To truly try and paint a picture of how strong Byakia became in this arc, let's look at his trajectory from the point of his survival after the first battle with the Vandenreich. Now, where characters like Renji, Toshiro, Zaraki, or Mayuri to name a few, each have either a new Bankai or a new form or something tangible to showcase their growth, Byakia doesn't really get anything material like that. Instead, we're just meant to assume he's stronger, faster, more powerful than he was before, simply due to his association with the royal palace. Rukia and Renji return from the palace with new abilities, so Byakia must have as well. And during his brief conversation with Korinji Tenjiro, Byakia alludes to as much, that he's now going to try and train to become at least significantly more powerful and more capable than he was before before his defeat. The closest acknowledgement we do get is that his Shikai Senbon Zakura is now so great, so all-encompassing in terms of mass, density, ferocity, and raw power that even as not believed it was his Bankai, despite having once wielded it himself, Senbon Zakura Kageyoshi, and he believed that that was what was now encircling the area around them. Considering at its most basic level, Byakia's Bankai is quite literally just a bigger version of his Shikai, this increase should be noticeable in Bankai 2 if it's already this noticeable here in Shikai. But in my opinion, it really isn't. We never really get that crucial visual depicting his Bankai as something new or greater than it was before. Again, we're just left to assume it is. That being said, the fact that his Shikai now resembles his Bankai is impressive, enough to leave as not lost for words at the fact. Although the explanation we get is brief and somewhat abstract, Byakia admits that he had forgotten the true essence of Senbon Zakra, and only after his Bankai was stolen was he able to reconnect with his blade again on that level to truly bolster its power to previously unseen heights. But perhaps Byakia's most impressive moment is still to come. Though Byakia fights alongside numerous other Shinigami in the all-out brawl that follows Ichigo's arrival on the battlefield, the truth is he vastly outclasses all of them, even if his relatively downplayed appearances might imply otherwise. When the fights are separated, Byakia finds himself battling five Sternritter at once, and while the Sternritter vary wildly in strength and ability in their own right, they're all at least captain level, whatever that really means at this point in the narrative anyway. Byakia battles Candice, Robert, Nanana, Lil Toto, and Meninus, and of the five of them, he successfully knocks out the first three on that list, while also managing to injure both Lil Toto and Meninus, all while seemingly not enduring a scratch himself. 
We've seen Candice fight before, but Robert and Nanana are fairly unknown entities. We can surmise that Nanana's shrift is virtually useless in a battle unless he has time to observe his opponent, and it's possible Biakia didn't give him any at all. Meanwhile, Robert is shown to be incredibly fast, but that's really about it, and unless he can catch his opponent truly off guard, we have no idea what he is capable of. Meninus remarks that it makes sense that she and Lil Toto are the only ones standing thanks to their respective abilities, but honestly, I don't know how that applies to Lil Toto, specifically based on what we see of her in the source material. Regardless, this is clearly supposed to be Byakuya's crowning moment, his triumph that places him on a pedestal far above his contemporaries on the battlefield. Everything we saw beforehand was just bluster, pomp and circumstance. When it came to it, Byakuya was perfectly capable of defeating virtually all of the surrounding Sturmritter with his Bankai without really breaking a sweat and completely on his own. It might not be as flashy as Zaraki outright butchering three of them and carrying them on his back like trophies, but Byakuya has always been a more subdued version of Zaraki as it is. Tossing them around like ragdolls while not even batting an eyelid at them feels very in character for Byakuya, especially a Byakuya of this level. But then Pepe enters the fight and things get a little messy for the captain. Now, no matter what you may think of Pepe, and you may assume, rightly so to some degree, that he's just a joke, throwaway character. But before Kubo decided to unceremoniously do away with the Sternritter of Love, it definitely felt like he was building him up to be quite the genuine threat. Now, is Pepe likely to be individually stronger than Biakia? Absolutely not, I would say, but he's shown to be a capable opportunist, exploiting both his allies and his enemies to gain an advantage he might not have otherwise had. Pepe makes quick work of Byakuya's best weapon, his own Zanpakuto, turning it against him ironically for the second time in this arc now, while also forcing Byakuya to confront one of his own allies as well. Even unarmed, Byakuya is able to make quick work of Hisagi, but Pepe continues to crank up the pressure, twisting the knife, so to speak, by having even a grievously injured Hisagi rise to his feet again, now wielding Sinbon Zakura himself in a furious flurry of attacks. Eventually, Pepe is even able to pierce Byakuya and his Oken clothing with his love rope, impaling him through the shoulder before preparing to shoot Byakuya with an arrow at close range. Again, just how deadly would this Cupid's arrow have actually been? It's difficult to say, but narratively Kubo is absolutely trying to show that Byakuya has been pushed into a corner by this foe before he is rescued in a timely fashion by Mayuri and his zombies. Honestly, it's a shame this fight does turn into such a mess, as I think Pepe could have been an interesting antagonist, but in the end, this fight doesn't really tell us much at all about Byakuya's current capabilities. And that's unfortunate, as this is the last example of Byakuya getting anything remotely close to a solo fight again before the end of the series. If he had simply used Bankai immediately, maybe there was a chance he could have overwhelmed Pepe with ease, but he didn't and he paid for it. But as the end of the arc approaches, Byakuya joins the rest of the remaining Gote 13 forces in facing off against Gerard Valkyrie. As I've mentioned before, Gerard is such a behemoth that it really is difficult to gauge anything from the fight against him. And as was also mentioned in my battle analysis of this fight, while Byakuya is the only fighter present here from start to finish, he also does so very little of any consequence, lazily throwing a few waves of Senbon Zakura Kagiyoshi around with seeming little care or urgency. But at the end of the battle, Byakuya finally gets a chance to show off some of his new strength and a brand new ability to go with it, perhaps implying a whole new level of mastery over his Bankai, much in the same vein as someone like Hitsugaya. 
After Gerard is frozen, Byakia appears and activates Senkei, Senbon Zakura Kageyoshi, surrounding Gerard's head with blades. But now, rather than being limited to striking with them one sword at a time, Byakia can use his newest ability, Ika Senjika, to viciously attack his enemy with every single blade at once. It's a genuinely palpable attack. There's a weighty explosion as a result of this ability as Byakia at long last justifies that trip to the royal palace. The fact that Ika Senjika seems to just be an extension of his regular Bankai and not something he has to wait any particular length of time before being able to activate like Hitsugaya's adult form is pretty remarkable. Although Gerard isn't killed, that's a result of Gerard's ability, not the captain's own ineffectiveness, and Gerard's entire head is obliterated as a result, which is all the more noteworthy when you remember just how gargantuan he has become over the course of their battle. But with the Thousand Year Blood War arc and Byakia's involvement in it coming to a close, how strong did he become in this final portion of Bleach? While Byakia's growth may not be as flashy or as outwardly spectacular as somebody like Zaraki's, who undergoes a very clear developmental path by achieving both Shikai and then Bankai, it's still clearly incredible all the same. Building upon a captain who was already the ideal model Shinigami in terms of his well-rounded combat abilities. In fact, if we return to that idea that Byakia and Zuraki are depicted as being reflective of one another, then it makes sense that Byakia too would end the series reaching a summit of power previously thought impossible. And actually, if we take a look at that trio of captains from the Gerard battle, it seems to me that by the end of Bleach, with all their newfound skills laid bare, that they each are designed to excel in different areas. Kenpachi Zaraki has incontestable physical strength, Toshiro's adult form has all-encompassing magical abilities designed to totally shut down his opponent, and Byakia retains his status as the impeccable all-rounder. While I do think that Byakia's somewhat lethargic role in the second half of the final arc makes it more difficult to ascertain exactly how strong he's become, there's no denying that of the newest version of the Gotei 13, he is one of the most powerful captains of them all, capable now of swatting away multiple captain level fighters at once with ease, thanks to an incredibly versatile skill set and a Zanpak toe that he now has a better, clearer understanding of than ever before. And that's it for the video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below just how powerful you think Byakia Kuchki has become since spending that time in the Royal Palace, since the second Quincy invasion and everything else that followed it. Is he now one of the most powerful captains of the entire Gotei 13? And where do you think he stacks up compared to the likes of Kyoraku, Zaraki and Hitsugaya? Maybe even throw Mairi in there for good measure as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Low. Like I said, Byakia is a difficult one to gauge, but I think we get at least some idea that he has reached these new heights of power. But I really hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already. And until next time, guys, I'll catch you later. And I'll see you then.